Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor Our guest today is Chris Caulfield. He is a nurse. He is an innovator. He is a co-founder of IntelliCare. It is one of the largest and fastest growing gig economy-based nursing workforce platforms in the United States. They just earned the largest nurse tech round of venture capital at 45 million Series B. I'm so grateful that you could make time to be on the podcast today, Chris, especially considering the global pandemic and the health crisis that we're all still dealing with right now in 2020. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much for having me, Katie. I was really impressed with IntelliCare's response uh, earlier this year when the COVID-19 pandemic first hit. You were um, really, I think, putting out a lot of messages of gratitude to the nursing community. And I think there were so many things going on, especially here in the U.S., where everyone was really taking a moment to to say thanks. I I remember some of the cheering that would happen every night. I think it was at seven o'clock in some of the major cities. And you can look back on that. And it's, it's eerie and strange to see a very quiet and still city like New York, all of a sudden erupting in cheers for our healthcare workers and and the people on the front lines. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about how you've navigated the pandemic as, as co-founder? Yeah, so in telecare, we're kind of right in the heart of, of COVID. Our business, we, we work on, on staffing long-term care facilities. And as many of you know, that is really the industry that is the hardest hit as far as patients' effects on COVID and the caregivers and nurses that are taking care of these patients. So we've really kind of flipped around our organization really to, to identify the resources and the interventions that we can appropriately utilize to really help out our clients and our nurses fight against COVID. And, you know, some of the stuff that we've been really working on is protecting nurses and giving them the information they really need to know to go into a facility and know what to expect, whether it be the education, whether it be the exposure levels that they're going into, whether it be the resources uh, for PPE that the facility has to offer to them. So we've really taken this, this seriously and we really, you know, turned our whole team around into to launching a fight against COVID and helping out nurses in nursing facilities. For those listeners who don't know, could you tell us a little bit about the pain point that IntelliCare addresses, particularly shortage of of nursing staff? Yeah, we focus on post-acute care, which is mostly skilled nursing facilities and assisted living. So we're, we're a workforce management company. And really what we're doing is we're helping nurses work when they want to around their schedule, while at the same time filling the gaps of these long-term care centers. And there's about 15,000 nursing homes in the United States. And these facilities They're not well staffed or resourced from a management and operations perspective compared to the bigger hospitals. They have a scheduling coordinator and a director of nursing that's really running the whole team there. And what they're trying to do is fill in for last minute call outs. At the same time, they're trying to really improve and maintain patient care. So our company is really helping those facilities match to nurses that are in their local area that can't always work seven days, you know, five days a week, 40 hours a week. So we're using our technology with mobile apps to really create that ultimate match on who needs a nurse and what nurse can work, and then reprioritizing back those nurses to increase the quality and consistency of care. So that's really our business, and that's really what the the innovations that we created based on some of the the significant issues that we found ourselves working as in nursing homes. So you really have two audiences, I would say, then for your innovation work. On one hand, it's the nurses who you need to recruit, who need to be highly skilled and and have a desire to join the platform. And then also the facilities who will be, I guess, contracting the nursing staff. That's correct. And both of those 
clients and users of ours, our employees and our and our facility partners, they both have their own unique issues. And it's really trying to get their issues and what they're really looking for as that user and trying to match them up to create that perfect match that ultimately solves the issue of short staffing, callouts, and improving patient care, which is ultimately the you know the final goal of of all healthcare is to make sure that the patient has the best care at the right time. Yeah. Can you tell us then how nursing has changed? I mean, this was earlier this year, your your company was awarded really the, lo- the, the largest venture capital round ever raised for nurse tech. That's incredible. Congratulations. Thank you tell, very much. If you could tell us about the journey that got you to that point. Um, and I'd love to know, you know, particularly about, you know, what, what kind of impacts IntelliCare has been able to make and then I'll dive in more with questions about the storytelling that helped you facilitate that Series B. Sure. So the pain points that we really experienced, me as a nurse, I've been a nurse for a little bit over 10 years now. And when I became a nurse, there was a lot of inefficiencies that were really, you know, throughout of all nursing, whether it be talking about the, the electronics from EMARS and documentation. And that's really what my first innovation came out, uh, working in a nursing informatics unit and trying to fix that process to make it easier to actually have nurses work to actually take care of patients rather than, you know, do half of their time focusing on documentation. Mm. And I, I was actually, I, I moved into a role that was a, a union representative. So I was representing the the nurses in my, in my long-term care hospital. Uh, for their issues with management and what we were really experiencing the biggest was you know being mandated to stay for a double shift or you know if we're not mandated and if somehow we slipped through the cracks and there just wasn't enough nurses at that particular time you'd be taking on double the amount of patient loads which really becomes unsafe so with those issues that we were experiencing and there was times where nurses were you know it was basically saying who got mandated last, or there was times where we had to break up fights of nurse saying, I can't stay, you're going to have to stay. So the, these issues were really bullying up. And we went around and we started looking at, you know, what type of contingency staffing solutions or agency staffing solutions can we bring in to really help our our particular unit and our particular long-term care center. And at that time, there was really no solutions. So we went out there, we reached out to agencies and some of the, the queue time for actually getting a nurse, it's usually you, you need a couple of days really ahead of time to request because they're making phone calls, making emails, really trying to twist people's arms to come in and pick up a sh- single shift. So the the staffing, the outside staffing organizations are really set up to, to come in and have a travel nurse come in for eight weeks, 12 weeks, because that's a, it's a pretty easy shift to fill uh, for an agency doing manual processes. But as far as filling in that last minute call off, the call off where somebody calls in two hours before and there's really no good solutions, the, the, the staff at that particular long-term care facility doesn't have the time to go through and make a hundred phone calls. So we came together and we were, you know, I actually joined and and started the company initially with, with the director of it that I was working in the hospital with trying to hack the EMAR systems. And we came together and said, is there, (laughs) is there a solution that we can, we can really take this and we can have an impact. And, you know, we built it from the ground um, off of kind of a clean slate of code. And, And he started, making the code and trying to make the the MVP and and me as the nurse, you know, what I was doing, I, I started off and and kind of building the recruitment team, um, you know, kind of the call center, credentialing and actually just filling shifts. So it's it's kind of finding out, you know, what type of resources you have, what's your MVP, and then ultimately looking at your vision and saying, what are we trying to solve here? So we we got together and and you know we started this process and you know since then we've we've added a lot of amazing team members that have really built out the company and really drove our company to you know recently we've been listed as the the fastest growing company in Massachusetts according to to Inc magazine. Congrats, uh, that's thank incredible. You. Thank you very much. And, and you know that the the fastest growing company isn't really you know as exciting to me as you know thinking about the amount of hours and, and staff that we've sent out there. And, yes. you know, we've, we've recently reached over the 2 million hour mark, um, you know, in our four year history uh, of being a company. So, you know, we're serving close to a, a thousand long-term care centers around the company, around the country. And, you know, we're, 
well over 15,000 uh, nurses working for us right now. And that's really, that's really the, the number. It's not, it's not the fastest growing as far as revenue. It's really how much service are you delivering and what's the need that you're filling. And that, that's what we're really excited about is, is really helping short staffing and helping patients out there. That's amazing. It's absolutely incredible to think about the the lag in time and some of the staffing challenges that existed and the ability of a platform like like yours to really turn all of that upside down and make things a lot more convenient and gain access much more rapidly to the care providers that they need. Yeah, and healthcare is usually the last to to really use this technology. So it's it's been waiting for a while. You know, if Uber can do it, you know, 10 years ago, you know, healthcare, we, we should have been we should have been first, but usually we're the last industry to really adopt technology. So it's very challenging. Uh, you know, it's something hearing your story. Did you ever think that you would be here, you know, when you were a nurse or a, a unit manager? Um, did you ever envision yourself running a company one day? Yeah, I think I think I had the entrepreneur bug. Uh, when I was a child, and and I was just looking for the right opportunity to really, really dabble into that space. I think, um, you know, I, I think as a really young kid, I think I was, you know, I had my lemonade stand out outside, you know, pulling cars over trying to sell them lemonade. So uh, <laughs> then I, I think at high school, I, I was joining, you know, the entrepreneurship club at the YMCA, and I think we were doing, I don't know, hot dog stands and things like that. And you know, going through college, it was always of what a, what type of profession can you go in and get a, a job that that's relatively secure and that gives you flexibility that can really allow you to use your innovation really to start your own projects and that that was my path along but i think that i was i was thinking of what what type of big impact can you have and where can you how can you spread this and how can you build that team to really get there i I don't think i ever thought i would have been in a situation that we've had so much success uh you know i think that's not necessarily what i've done that's really what the team is has come on and been able to do. Uh, so I think that that's really being in the right place at the right time and getting the right people to really scale your idea to have that big impact. So I don't think I was necessarily thinking I would be where I am today, but it, it happened and, and we're so excited to be here. I want to ask you a deeper question about your team and that's where I was going next. But then you said something that really it kind of hit me at the gut level. And you said, I wanted to make an impact. I wanted to see how how big I could, what the greatest impact could possibly be. And I have to admit that even though I am also an entrepreneur and a, a CEO, I had this gut reaction where I thought that is such a scary desire. Did you ever feel afraid of that, of, of having a vision that big? You know, I think sometimes it can feel more comfortable even when we're starting uh, you know, creating a new company, whether it's tech focused or not, you know, we were creating something new or innovative. It can, it can be a little bit scary to say, I want to dream of the biggest impact possible. So what, what gives you the, like, what gives you the, the sort of like confidence in your gut or so what is it that, what's the formula for, for dreaming like that? Because I, I find it interesting, at least on a personal level that I find that to be challenging sometimes. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a scary world out there. And I think, I think the only reason why my goals, um, I can actually get out there and really try to do that is I'm not scared to fail and, you know, failing. I, I think when we started in telecare, we were, we were targeting a market. We thought it would be the easiest to kind of get our solution into home care. They experience a lot of the same issues and short staffing. And we thought that would be the, the easiest entry point. And we, we failed. There was some more complexities within the home care market at that time. And our organization wasn't really ready for that at that point. And I, I think being willing to fail and almost being ready to fail and then get up really fast and pivot and turn and make adjustments is really the only way that you can, you know, not be scared of, of, of the future and really, you know, go after your goals and go after the big dream. So I think that's one of those those conditions or traits that you really need to have that you're not scared to fail and you get up quicker um, and you don't give up. So I think that's, that's really allowed me to, to keep going on, on this long journey. I love that. Could you tell us a little bit more about the pivot and 
the the teamwork that was involved. I, I noticed um, one of your recent LinkedIn posts, you were talking about your entrepreneurial journey and you said it wasn't until you found the right team that you found success. So if you could share with us a little bit more in, in your perspective, what makes a great startup team and how have you been able to leverage each other's strengths? Maybe you can speak about that specifically with regard to the pivot that you just described or, or uh, maybe it's a broader perspective you want to share on, on the, the right team. Sure. And to start off with a broader perspective, you know, the team of IntelliCare right now, internally, we're, we're a little bit over 100 internal staff members that are, that are hacking this process. So that's, that's really, you know, there's been so many pivots and so many adjustments based on the new team members that we've had join uh, that really have got us to that, you know, fastest growing company. But if we take it back to, to the original founders, probably about five years ago, um, when it was more of an idea stage. You know, we were working on on home care because we thought it was the easy entry point. You know, going out there and finding a client, which is just dealing with one one family versus dealing with a corporation, and you know, dealing with the staff, uh, matching those two. And we thought it would be relatively straightforward, and and we were relatively successful with that. We were growing the company pretty fast, but it was it was harder to raise capital in, in that business because there was a lot of competitors out there that were raising big venture rounds, and and we had a small and, and relatively inexperienced team with me and, and the the first co-founder Ike Na. So we were trying some things out. We were actually kind of scared to dabble into new markets, but when once we actually brought on on two additional co-founders, uh, one being Prince Na and the other being David Coppins, they really came in and they looked at at the business holistically. And they kind of started evaluating, well, what other type of customers are out there? And then we, you know, we started looking at, you know, long-term care and it was actually the industry that, that my, most of my nursing experience really came from. And, and we started looking at, you know, there's, you can do this, this on-demand nursing with, with one client to one nurse. So you could have a bigger business that needs a hundred shifts or potentially a thousand shifts. And, you know, your, your pool of nurses is really be able to match better with, with that availability. And of course, there's different types of technologies that you have to build to that. It's not as easy just having an app and, and then asking nurses to work. You're building in consistency and ratings and training. But we found that you know, once we had our, our new co-founders join up and they just went out there and they just, you know, started hitting the street and finding out, is there a market fit for our product in these in these new and different types of businesses that we were used to providing care? And what we did is we we found some traction and we found some traction. The team that we brought over, uh, you know, our, our chief of sales officer actually had some significant experience in that market. So he was able to, to get in there and enter faster. And, you know, with our, with our CEO that we brought in at that time, and this was still, you know, at the early idea stage, he was able to really structure our business and bring in the additional team members around us that would make us more successful. So, you know, without, with sticking at two co-founders, I think that we were just, you know, keep on hitting our heads against the wall. But once we brought in an additional well-rounded team, that's really what launched us off to that fast track. Incredible. Yes. I, 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 uh, that, that's really important advice. I think that it can feel a, a lot more nerve wracking and like you need to play it safer if you are really hardly have time to even look up from the current efforts that you're trying to, uh, to fulfill. And by strategically putting almost scouts out there <laughs> to say, we are devoting this amount of time to strategy. We're devoting um, this effort to looking up and seeing what other go-to-market strategies could exist. That's where it sounds like the breakthrough really happened. A hundred percent. You need somebody focus on strategic thought and not just in in the in the the trenches, you know, in the operations. So that that really allowed us to really to really find our market niche and really explode. And and that is truly such a challenge for most startups. So it's it's really helpful to hear how how you guys were able to navigate that part of your journey. I want to go back to storytelling. What role do you feel storytelling played in the beginning when you were just getting traction for IntelliCare? And then I want to fast forward and ask, what was it like raising the, your latest round? And how did, how has the story honed and shifted over the years? Sure. The the story, at, at least my founder story, has always really been the same uh, because I was 
really in the life of a nurse and, and being stuck and experiencing those nurses fighting over who's staying and taking care of too many patients that you could take care of safely. So I think the story is, is, has mostly been the same for me. Um, you know, and the business has really taken that story and, and used it really to get other new employees excited to join the company. And, you know, starting from the initial co-founders, you know, without that story, we wouldn't have convinced our other fellow co-founders to join because you can't really get that much excitement off of just describing a business. You really have to understand the emotional impacts and the the vision and what we're really going to go out there and what we're going to solve. And and there's a story behind that with nurses and patients that really need uh, the proper care. So I think that from the start, getting the founders, the, the story was incredibly important. And, you know, up from there, every time that you know, our company has had a success, whether it be winning a client to come on and to join our organization to actually staff them. There's there's going to be a story behind that and what type of what type of benefits and features that we have, but you know, still understanding their story and what really is their pain. And you know, until you understand their story, you're not going to actually be able to 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 join up and partner with them. So I think there's a combination of a bunch of different factors there of, of stories. And as far as pitching uh, for investors, that's really the intro is, is you have to have a, an investor understand how this is working out in the real world and what does this actually impact. And this the story is how you intro, you know, any type of pitch that you're going to present, whether it be to an investor, whether it be to your boss, whether it, you know, just to be a colleague, to really get them get them on board, to get them motivated and get them driven and have the same vision that that really what you're trying to solve. So I think storytelling is extremely uh, important and, and it's a must have for any type of entrepreneur that wants to be successful. It, it matters so deeply that you had so many firsthand experiences as a nurse listening and experiencing those, those pains in scheduling and over, you know, shortages of staff at a personal level. Cause it sounds like that's played a role in the messaging that's, that's created this pull strategy to let your network of, of nurses, nursing staff grow. Um, you mentioned the desire to have more flexibility in their schedules or a uh, desire not to have those kinds of fights uh, or to, to, you know, make a good amount, uh, you know, a, sh- a fair amount of money for the kinds of services they provide. So I'm imagining that the stories and the messaging that you articulate to the nursing staff is different from the clients. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how... It, what, what's also interesting to me is when you have different audiences and almost every startup or, or you know, team does, when you have different audiences, you also have to make sure that the stories you're telling to either audience still will resonate and not alienate the other audience. Yeah. So could you tell us about how you've kind of negotiated that or um, work to kind of align a larger message for, for the company? Sure. And, and I, I think a lot of the messaging really, is, we've got a great team of, of marketing, um, real senior level folks that have joined the team that can really hone on this messaging. So they've taken to a much higher level than than I can even explain. However, you know, short staffing, it really speaks on on both the nurse and the, the healthcare organization, the long-term care facility. They both understand that. They, they may think of you know, the ramifications of that are are quite different. So from a facility perspective, short staffing, they could be thinking about patient outcomes. And, you know, in patient outcomes as a business, they think about, you know, the reimbursement um, that goes along with sending a, a patient back to the hospital. They, they can get dinged from CMS uh, in the current system. They also think about turnover and, and what that impact will have and the, the trickle down effect, you know, throughout their whole staff and, and their ability to really maintain good staffing uh, for safe care. So, you know, it's it's a slightly different perspective uh, when you're thinking about their pains. Um, but, you know, short staffing, it, they understand short staffing and what it means to them. And in the nurses side, the nurses and CNAs, short staffing was, was just like the situation that, that I really experienced. It's taking on too many patients and, and feeling like it's unsafe. It's being very, very stressed out, having complex patients and not having any help from other nurses and not 
not because the other nurses don't want to help you. It's just because they they have their own patient load and and nursing home. You know, it's it's slightly different from from being at a hospital. At a hospital, you might take four or five patients on as a nurse, and, and at a nursing home, you might have fifteen to twenty. So. It's a lot of managing and juggling um, and making sure you're prioritizing appropriately. So I, I think the story and, and the pain point is the same, but how they think about um, how it affects themselves and their business is slightly different. Uh, but you know, you all tie it back into ultimately patient care and, and well-being of the staff, and everyone really understands that. I see also that your platform is diversifying. You not you, you don't only supply nursing staff now, you also train nurses. And now you are the creator of the highest utilized COVID-19 nurse training course. Did I get that right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, we've had about 500,000 uh, completions, a little over 500,000 completions of our, of our COVID-19 nurse training. And, you know, to date, I, I, I haven't been able to find anybody that's, that's had a, a higher utilized course. So that was a, an amazing uh, innovation that we really were able to push off in a short period of time. I think it was is February when, when we started hearing the, the stories uh, of nurses saying that they're not prepared and they really don't have any training or policies in place to really take on COVID and to understand COVID. And, uh, you know, I think National Nurses United survey came out and really showed that with, with some metrics. And, and when we saw that, I really came up and, and I started talking to, to the executive team, the senior team, and saying that, hey, we, we've built some training before in the past and we made some animated models. And there was rapid adoption in, in our app uh, of nurses taking these courses that weren't actually required, but uh, you know, we had 60,000 completions uh, you know, within six months of, of these courses, which was pretty incredible, the amount of traction that we had. So we had the process down as far as creating animated modules, making them fun, making them interactive. And we had the resources because we, we've had the team that really, that took this on and was able to do it fast. So we buckled down, uh, made a plan and really just, you know, worked th through the nights getting this COVID-19 course. And, you know, ultimately it comes out to, I think it's a one, one contact hour course and we were able to get it accredited and we, we pushed it off into, you know, the LinkedIn world and the social media world. And what we did is we, we, really had traction when we asked nurses to share the course. We we gave them a little message and we said, you know, share COVID-19 nurse safety as a hashtag. And nurses started sharing that with that, their friends and their colleagues. And you know, we started looking at the Google tracking and there was over 30 countries of nurses that, that took the course and over 500,000 completions. And we were able to create a little platform for facilities to sign up their nurses and to track their progress. And we had uh, several hundred uh, facilities, even, you know, not just in the U.S. and not just hospitals and nursing homes. We had universities and different international institutions that that actually signed up their, their staff and and we had some great success. And we, you know, we're we're looking at this as, well, if we can do this, you know, what other type of trainings can we provide out to the market of those that really need nurse nurse training and provide an interactive form of that. So it's it's super exciting. We had great success. I think we had a big impact. And now we're kind of looking at the future and seeing what can we do next with this nurse education. Yes, that's incredibly exciting. I, I just want to say as well, I know we kind of started with this, but thank you for your company. Thank you to all of the nursing professionals who are part of IntelliCare, all of the nursing professionals on the front line or, or not on the front line. Just thank you for everything that you're doing. Um, and I know that this has been a really um, unpredictable and unprecedented time. And uh, we really just can't say thank you enough. As we wrap up, could you share some keys to success or pieces of advice that you would give to innovators as they prepare to convey their great ideas and scale them? Sure. So I'll, I'll give three key advice points. One is before you start any innovation or entrepreneurship journey, make sure you're you're passionate about the issue. If you don't have passion for your issue, you you won't be really dedicated to, to put in the, the 50, 60, 70 hours of work. It's going to take a week to really get your, your product out to the market. So have passion. Secondly, it, it's find a good mentor. We couldn't have made IntelliCare what it is without bringing on more senior folks that have done it before. So no matter how much 
passion you have if you haven't done it before there, there's a learning process and it will become much much easier if you if you bring in a mentor that's done it and and third as i mentioned before is you're going to fail more often than you succeed and just be ready for it. it it's part of of innovating it's part of entrepreneurship and if you're scared of failure there's no way that you'll you'll actually succeed that is a powerful way to close out our conversation. Chris, thank you so much. Um, I know that I'm going to take a lot of these strategies with me as I continue working with my business. And I hope that everyone listening um, is inspired by the growth that IntelliCare has seen. Thanks for everything that you're doing. Thanks so much for having me, Katie. Where can listeners find out more about IntelliCare and you? So our website is IntelliCare.com and you can find me. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. It's Christopher Caulfield, RNNPC uh, for my title. Perfect. And we will also link the COVID-19 nurse training course um, in the show notes and we'll link to the website as well. So you can follow all of their exciting uh, growth this year. Thank you so much, Chris, for being on the podcast. Thanks so much, Katie. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content.